But here, I would like to suggest the story of Jacob wrestling with God as a trans text. Duke Divinity School now has a new congregation they call Divinity Pride. Divinity Pride affirms the dignity, faithfulness, and strength of lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, queer, questioning, intersex, asexual, and gender sexually non-conforming Christians. Do you know, do you know what an oxymoron is? We want to affirm everyone to be who they truly are, to step into the Holy One's fire that burns away all that says we are not good enough and refines us by the Pentecostal fire. I'm gonna put a list right here, probably at the end of the video, of things they talk about and never explain. To be who exactly the great queer one calls us to be. The great queer one? The names don't stop there. They get weirder. Strange one, fabulous one, fluid and ever becoming one. Do not allow us to make our ideas of you into an idol. You are as close to us as our own breath, and yet your essence transcends all that we can imagine. As you're making this into an idol, you say, don't let us make you into an idol. Literally just read the scriptures. There's so many opportunities where you can see, hey, this is what makes an idol. Hey, don't do this. And you're doing that. It, it gets worse. You are mother, father, and parent. You are sister, brother, and sibling. You are drag queen and trans man and gender fluid, incapable of limiting your vast expressions of beauty. Blessed are our bodies. Blessed is our love. Blessed are we when we celebrate that which the world turns away. Fill our hearts with a pride rooted in resistance. Fill our hearts with pride. You're asking God to fill your heart with pride of all things? Mm, this is going to be a long video. As a child growing up in Colorado Springs and later in rural North Carolina, I never questioned that God was a bearded white man on a cloud, complete with a penis, finger issues. Look, I don't know what the people in your childhood taught you, but that's not what God is. I talked about this in my last video, but I'll sum it up here shortly. A creator can't be part of something they create. A painter isn't part of the painting. God is not part of the universe in the physical sense. He created it, so he's immaterial. That means he's not a man, he's not sitting on a cloud, and he certainly doesn't have a penis. As I ended one relationship with the God of my childhood, I began another with a deliciously queer God who loves in scandalous ways and created us for pleasure and wholeness. A deliciously queer God that loves in scandalous ways? Please don't, please don't ever say that again. Who loves in scandalous ways and created us for pleasure and wholeness. Created us for pleasure and wholeness. Define pleasure, define wholeness, then we can talk. A queer God is a God who loves every part of us. A God who doesn't meet us where we are because they are already there. God loves us so much that he created us. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. He also loves us enough to bring us into heaven even when we don't deserve it. However, there's things about ourselves that God does not love. Like sin. Literally only sin. Beloved, you are never called to abandon yourself. Never called to abandon yourself. Deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow me. How about that? It's amazing how the phrase dying to oneself has been weaponized to mean kill any part of yourself that doesn't match with the theology of a professor, a pastor, or a parent. I actually agree. Abandoning the self is negating the truth of who you are. I'm putting that on the list. In the pews, we listen to the pastor who preaches about commandments, condemning those who disobey, predicating a fire, a future of fire and turmoil. Another example of someone who was told wrong things growing up. Imagine that. I'm reminded of the commandment of love and how it is the greatest of these. Careful. My mind is banished, forbidden, 
and even forgotten within these walls. And you dropped it. What do you mean by your love? And I fear this fire and burning may be my fate. What if my end comes before I can also preach these commandments with my love being at the center? If you put your love in the center of those commandments, you're making an idol of God. I was force-fed messages that told me to the very core everything that I was feeling about myself was wrong, disgusting, perverse, and unwanted. One person's distorted message of the gospel doesn't give you any right to distort it in another way. It wasn't until I got out of the toxicity of my upbringing that I was able to engage with the healing work of deconstruction that allowed me to sit comfortably with my identity for the very first time. Seriously? Deconstruction. I began to come out to my closest friends and find spaces where I could explore queerness and faith in conjunction with one another. Having faith in him doesn't mesh with being queer and following whatever makes you feel good. What are you doing, man? This lady mentions the story of Jacob. Here's a quick summary. She talks about the story of Jacob in Genesis where Jacob wrestles with God and becomes Israel. God wounds him in the hip and then renames him as Israel. Both of these things are symbolic. Jacob is the seed of the future people of Israel, so his name becomes Israel. Israel also means wrestles with God, which is why he was named that way, and it's symbolic of how Israel would wrestle with God for all of time. Now that we've heard the story of Jacob, let's watch it get trampled. But here, I would like to suggest the story of Jacob wrestling with God as a trans text, as the story that locates, locates trans people at the heart of God's story. Trans people aren't at the heart of God's story. God is at the heart of God's story. Jacob enters into an intimate, fraught relationship with the divine, and on the other side, he is transformed in both name and body. He doesn't enter into an intimate relationship. He wrestles with God. He looks God in the face. And while he is renamed, he's not transformed in body. He didn't change the function of any part of his body. He was just bruised, so we walked with a limp. But in Jacob's wrestling, I see an example of a negotiated body. Negotiated body. Do you, do you know what that means? Do you know that I'm gonna put it on the list? A trans body. Ah, a negotiated body is a trans body. Got it. Which has been both momentarily injured and fundamentally blessed. Ah, hold on, don't try to sneak that past us. A trans person that goes through hormones or surgery isn't temporarily damaged. If you take hormones, they don't go away after you stop taking them, they're still in your body. And if you have surgery and you have a part of your body removed, and sometimes removed and placed somewhere else, that doesn't change, that doesn't just go back to how it was before. That's permanent. But in my life, and the lives of many other trans, non-binary, and gender non-conforming Christians, transition is better framed as a calling. Transition is better framed as a calling, she says. Because if we talk about it as a transition or as surgery, people kind of freak out. It is a calling to wrestle with God and not let go until we receive a blessing in our own bodies. Jacob wrestled with God, but he wasn't sinning when he did that. Do you think you're gonna get a blessing from God? by sinning in his face and calling that wrestling with him? Eventually I realized that God was calling me to more than just life. God was calling me to see their abundant love for me. What could be more than life? When God calls us to live truly with him, to really live life, he's talking about eternal life with him. There is nothing better than that. It wasn't God who didn't love me, it was me who didn't love me because I listened to the hate I had been marinating in all of my life. I told you guys, these people, they lived in hatred their whole childhood. Just because they walk away from hatred in their lives previously doesn't mean they've stumbled upon the truth. I began to see and hear God's becoming call in new ways that brought me here to Duke. What is this? What does this mean? We deserve to be affirmed. Affirmed means not just validated, but that everyone agrees with you. Ain't gonna happen. Guess what? God himself doesn't agree with you. We deserve to be loved. 
Nobody deserves love. It sounds harsh, but we don't even deserve God's love. We deserve the money too. Nobody deserves to get the money too. It's just another worldly thing that's going to be gone when God comes back. You're not going to miss it then, and I hope you don't miss your chance either. Get connected with us because we are building something that they can't stop. Go forth <laughs> in the courage of the Holy Spirit. Go forth in the courage of the Holy Spirit and blaspheme God all the way. Sure, thanks. This lady is a professor. I hope all of you know now that just because somebody has the title professor doesn't mean that they're trustworthy. Sadly, it should. And lastly, you might not have cringed enough already, but take a look at this. Oh, and Easter is coming. Thank you. If you, like me, are fascinated with this kind of cringe, I have another video on it, so take a look up here. Or if you want to see some cool ancient wisdom from the Bible, take a look at this playlist. Either way, I'll see you next time.